Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens. SouthwoodGardenCenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches adds a little romance to the landscape by propagating willows. In the Concepts Garden, we have an inexpensive do-it-yourself irrigation system to keep your pots watered. We safely store our home and garden chemicals, and we add moisture crystals to our potting soil to help keep our container plants happy. While many people think a willow is just a pond weed, I like the more romantic image of a graceful tree draped over the pond's edge. A lot of people think of weeping willows as probably the most familiar willow, um, but there's also the globe willow, which looks like a weeping willow, although it is a different species. Um, it looks kind of like a weeping willow in the fact that it's been trimmed up and has more of a globe shape to its form. There's also the corkscrew willow, which has contorted branches, which gives you a little interest throughout the winter time when it loses its leaves. The corkscrew willow is also popular to use in flower arrangements as the branches give some added interest. Now, if a willow tree is a little bit too big for your landscape, you might consider the dapple willow, which can be a large shrub. It is a hardy shrub here in Oklahoma from zones four to nine. Like the other willows, it does like wet conditions. However, it's better known for its foliage as it has variegated white and green foliage with just whispers of pink on the tips of it. Dappled willows can get quite large as a shrub, but you can maintain a smaller size by trimming them back. Willows have been used throughout the ages in ethnobotany. They were often used by apothecaries because the bark of the willow actually contains components, compounds that are similar to aspirin. They've also been used, their long branches have been used for weaving, both baskets and wattle fences. Now you might know if you've ever tried to create a wattle fence, when you put a live willow branch in the ground, sometimes it does root, which kind of led us to a little experiment that we wanted to do. We were trying to root some willow ourselves and we left some in a glass water jar. Now this was exposed to all the sunlight. Of course, willows like water, so we thought this would be a good way to root them. This jar, we left them in water, but we put a bag over them to exclude the light. And you can see the difference in the amount of roots that we got on the two. This is both the curly willow and the dappled willow. Both seem to do better when we excluded the light. Cuttings are an asexual way of propagating a new plant. So if you've ever taken a cutting from a willow tree and put it in the ground to make a wattle fence, you may have unintentionally propagated that willow. Now the best time to take cuttings of willows is late fall and early spring. If you are like me and you like the romantic image of a willow tree or perhaps want to make a wattle fence, go help your neighbor trim their willow. Adding containers into your landscape is a great way to provide additional interest. We often use containers not only to elevate plants, but also perhaps provide a better environment for a plant that might require a little better soil than what we have in our garden. Containers come in a wide array of uh, colors and textures. And one of the big things about container gardening is we often think about how we might need to water them more. Well, there's a couple of factors to consider. And when it comes to containers, size does matter. Bigger is better. And in fact, when I go shopping for containers, I often tell people, 
look at what size you think you're gonna get and then actually get the next size larger. Larger containers will require less watering. The other thing you want to think about is whether it's a porous container or not. You can see they come in an array of glazes and textures, and a lot of times that adds not only interest, but it also actually helps hold that moisture in there. We also have terracotta pots that we use a lot of times, and they are porous, and so we're going to lose some soil moisture to evaporation as that water leaches into the clay around it. Now again, if this was glazed, that would help seal that pot a little bit better. You might also have a plastic pot or something that is not porous, and this of course will hold more moisture, therefore require less watering. Now these are pretty small containers, so they will require a little bit more watering. And the next thing you're going to consider is your potting media. Now this is just traditional potting soil that we have and is good for most plants, um, but you might want to consider using something different if you're using succulent plants. Succulent plants need a little more drainage in them and so a lot of times their potting soil will have more sand and grit in it. Your traditional potting soil is composed of vermiculite, perlite, um, peat moss, sphagnum moss, things like that. And they can come in a, any number of different recipes, but most of those work for your general vegetables or annual plants that you're gonna use. We actually have some perlite down here. Perlite is the white material that you often find in your potting soil. And it's actually a volcanic rock that when it's heated, um, it expands and it's very lightweight. So it adds to that aeration um, in your soil profile. Alternatively, sometimes styrofoam is used in potting soil. It does add to aeration, um, but styrofoam floats. So when you water your pot, you might notice that styrofoam actually rising and coming over the edges of your container. Now, if you want a little more insurance for your pot when you're watering it, you can buy these uh, moisture holding crystals. Um, this is just a small bag, but a small amount goes a long way. Um, and basically, these are crystals that you can add to your potting soil. And when you water your plant, they absorb a lot of that moisture and release that moisture slowly as the plant needs it. So again, this will just help increase the amount of time between waterings. Um, on your containers. Now again, the next factor you consider is your plant selection. Uh, if you're using your typical annuals and bedi uh, bedding plants, then potting soil works well. And again, you can add your soil moist. Um, but if you are looking at succulent plants, then of course they won't need as much water. So you wouldn't want to add any of these water retaining crystals to that potting media. Succulents naturally will be able to uh, be a little more drought tolerant and withstand a longer period between waterings. Finally, the next thing you might want to consider is grouping your pots together. Not only does it create a great focal point and it really highlights the pots, but it also allows for ease of watering. If you have to drag a hose around, you only have to drag a hose to one spot to get all of your pots. Not only that, but if you ever go on vacation and you have somebody come over and water your pots, again, the, it kind of gives you a little reassurance that all of them will get watered. A lot of times when you have your pots scattered around, you might miss one or two, and it's kind of devastating when you come back and see a wilted plant. Now, if this is still too high maintenance to water your pots by hand, you of course can always hook up your pots to irrigation. And again, grouping your pots together um, requires less plumbing than if they were scattered around. To find out more about how to hook up our pots to irrigation, we've got a couple of students from Dr. Luanella's landscape irrigation class. And Tyler, tell us how to hook up our pots to irrigation. Okay, so small tubing, also known as spaghetti tubing, is an excellent option for irrigating these pots. It supplies a sufficient flow of water, and it also is small or flexible enough and discreet enough not to take away from your plants. All right, so we have to run this through each of our pots? Yes, ma'am. Preferably before you put the potting soil in. Uh -huh. You will run the spaghetti tubing up from the bottom here. And most of these pots come with holes in them. So. Right, at the bottom, yes. And so you'll run it up. So this is what goes through the bottom, and this is out through the top, which hooks up to this small emitter here. Okay. So, and then that emitter also, you can kind of change the... Adjust the, the flow. Okay, yep. very nice. Here. This little piece here is what actually hooks in to your lateral line, which we ran off of the main line over here. Okay. So this so, will be the line that's carrying our water correct, over here to the correct. pots. This little tool here mm -hmm. 
is what you use. You poke a hole in it. There. All right. And this plugs into it just like this. You just push it in until you hear the snap. There. All right. You can see it's all the way in. And then the line, the spaghetti tube, which is at the bottom of this pot, plugs in right here, just like that. Then you take your emitter and plug it in here. Now you're ready to go. You just put it right in the middle of your pot and get water to your plants. And that'll create a nice little spray for us. Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, so now we need to go ahead and hook up the rest of these pots real quick. Correct. All right. So Chase, Tyler helped hook us up with our pots. Can you tell us how to hook our pots to our main irrigation system now? Yes, so you see Tyler hooked it up, took, hooked all of the emitters up to this pipe that runs all the way around the big pot in the middle. Uh -huh. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this, put this T and connect both ends of that. So we connect these together, and what we're doing is we're actually creating a manifold okay. to connect this back to our main water source. So we just used a T to make a loop, and we've got all our pots plugged into that loop. Yes, ma'am. So we've created our own manifold, but is there something else that we could have used? Yes. So you can buy these already manufactured manifolds, mm -hmm. and you just connect them to a pipe in the ground. and. So some of these are raised up to make it easier to connect your spaghetti tubing to your manifold. But the tricky thing about these is these are only allowed eight or six spaghetti tubes. Well, if you want to have more pots, then you have to have more than one manifold, oh, of okay. course. Okay. And so with our manifold that we have created, you can add or subtract pots and uh, it's a little less expensive than having manifolds because most of the time you have these materials laying around already. So if I do want to subtract a pot, I'm going to leave a hole there. How do I fix that hole? So what they have are these plugs called goof plugs. And what you do is you when you take where your spaghetti pipe connected to your manifold, you just add one of these into that hole and it will stop the water. All right, so are we all hooked up now? Yes, but one thing you want to make sure you do before you go, just let it go, you need to always make sure to test everything, run it, make sure there's no leaks and no pipes have busted off or need to be pushed on more. All right, sounds great. Thanks for hooking up our irrigation for us. You're welcome. We're here with Charles Looper, and you are with the Pesticide Safety Education Program. And Charles, we want to start our spring off right and talk about some safety things about pesticides and insecticides. So what's one of the first things that we need to know regarding how to handle our products? Well, one of the first things when we're, we're mixing, I would suggest is um, segregate if you have the ability to buy two different sprayers. Um, Having a sprayer dedicated just for herbicides, weed killers, that kind of thing. Uh, so when you go to spray weeds in your tomatoes or something, you won't have carryover when you go to spray for um, insects. You don't want to have that product carry over and cause issues. So we, if we designate that can help out if we dedicate those, if that's available. If not, you can always really rinse these out, clean these out if you need to use one sprayer for the other. But that simplifies that going on. Because herbicides, you could accidentally kill your tomatoes. Right, if you use the wrong herbicide behind your insecticide, there could be enough carryover to carry, you know, to kill that tomato if we use the wrong herbicide going on there. So, um, so going into our garage, how do we need to like handle this material and, and keep it from 
causing any damage with other products. When we come with storage, uh, whether we're talking about our garage, a, a garden shed or something like that, um, pesticides need to be stored in their original containers okay. uh, because they're going to have that a label on there tell us what they are. We won't get them confused. We don't want to ever store them anything other than original container uh, going on. Uh, try to keep them away from uh, materials such like bird seed, uh, fertilizer, dog food, any kind of thing. If you do have a spill, you don't want those products absorbing that when they spill. Uh, and we're not wanting a spill, but that's something to avoid storing those near there. And you have this in a tub. That's not just for display. Oh right? yeah, real real simple way. You know, you can buy very expensive cabinets and stuff, but this is always something I say. These nice little plastic containers you find at, at a lot of stores are a containment system. So if I store these on a shelf in my garage, if there is a leak, we're going to catch anything into this pan instead of all over our floor, our shelves, into anything else. And uh, you know, if you have individual products, you could even still use that. And when you go to clean it up, it would be a lot easier to clean up, right. uh, avoid exposure, those kind of and things. And that's, that's kind of a handy uh, thing to use even in your home with cleaning supplies oh, under your kitchen yeah, sink definitely. and that sort of stuff. You know, you know, depending on how long, if you, something leaks, it's better to go into something like that than say all over that wood or there, something there. Right. You know, this is a repurposed uh, kitty litter box. That's, you know, typical plastic container. You know, even these, when they're full, if you don't spray them out, we want to try to spray them out at the end of the day, but that'd be another thing you can hold those on to going on there um, with those. So, so one thing we always get asked, I know you get asked a lot, is about um, the degradation of the pesticide with the temperatures. I mean, if we have, we're coming out of winter, um, are our pesticides still good? And also, will they be good going into the heat of the summer? Yeah, all pesticides are going to have a little bit unique chemistry and things, and that's very hard thing to put an actual date or, or number on. Mm -hmm. uh, what we go with storage, uh, you know, climate, you know, garage or something that doesn't get too cold is probably better. I like to store my stuff out in a garden shed away from the garage, so it's just away from children. Again, the more we can keep these things away, uh, usually you're going to have enough heat maybe from there. Cold is usually probably worse on these products than um, heat. Okay. Um, they're probably still going to work just fine. The mixing things, if they freeze, sometimes they'll separate out and not be usable if they get too cold, if they freeze. Because you just through. can't get that solution It back. just totally separates out and they're unusable that way. Okay, all and right. Then, and then we have problems, what do we do with it then? Okay, so ideally the best situation would be to only buy the size of a container that you think you'll use throughout the season? Definitely. I know a lot of people like to go best bang for their buck, you know, cheaper per quantity, but when we talk about pesticides, really we want to buy the quantities we'll use up and not have a whole lot left around or get left with lots of carryover because then it becomes an issue later on down what do I do with it later on right well, well that leads me to my next question so once we've used a container what do we need to do with it to dispose of it properly okay so once we empty let's say this one's empty here um, what our standard practice is where we're talking about homeowners or all the way up to you know large uh, pesticide sprayers is we want to get this as empty as possible uh, and then we could take and triple rinse this okay so which means we'll fill it up once we want to spray that out, fill it up twice, spray it again. And you would just spray it out where you've applied it before? Right. We want to spray on a labeled site, so where we've been spraying, okay. and we're going to use that spray water. And so after three times, that is considered to clean that out and become like normal trash. So Charles, after we've triple rinsed the container, is there anything else we need to do? Uh, we can go ahead and puncture a hole in the bottom so they cannot be reused. Uh, pesticide containers. Uh, should not ever be reused for any other uh, purpose. Okay. Um, so this would either go into your normal household trash stream. Uh, they are recyclable containers. So if they're, uh, it's up to the recycler to whether they take that out, but they are eligible for recycling also uh, to go to that it, once we empty them up. Uh, best option to go for there. They of course would need to check with their local recycling center yeah, that, to make sure that the center accepts the that. The center would have, you know, they have a right of refusal so they could not accept those but uh, they would could be eligible for recycling All like right. any other household products. Well thank you Charles for getting us off to a great start this spring. Okay. Doke. Adding moisture retaining crystals to your potting soil and your containers is a great way to help reduce the amount of times that you have to water your pots this summer. So each 
brand has kind of a different recipe for what you're going to want to mix and you want to make sure to read the container and the package clearly. Um, you can see here we had just over about a half a teaspoon of this and we added water to it. So you can see how much it expands um, and each one of these are holding some moisture in it and the idea is that you add this to your potting soil it captures that moisture when you water your pots and then releases it to your plant as it needs it. Um, it allows your plant to have access to more water without sitting in soggy soils. So again, that's just a little over a half a teaspoon that we added to that pot so you can see how much it expands. You wanna make sure you follow the directions and not to add more to the container um, because if you add more, obviously it's going to expand and kind of explode your potting soil and push all of that out. So that can be a problem. So I'm gonna show you how to use this. What you're gonna do is fill up your container about two thirds of the way with the potting soil that you wanna use. And we have a 10 inch container here and so Per our directions, we're going to need about one and a half teaspoons of this material. So we're going to just put that on top. There's one teaspoon. And here's another half a teaspoon. So you can see it doesn't look like much um, and it seems like a small bag, but this will go a long ways. What we're then going to do is mix this in with our potting soil. You can hardly tell that it's even in there, but at this point we're going to go ahead and plant our plants and then we'll cover with just potting soil on top. Here we've got some edamame that we're going to plant in our container here. We're just finishing it with straight topsoil. We're not using any of those crystals on top so you don't see any of that expand. It will expand down um, amongst the roots where the plant can access that additional moisture. Now anytime you plant up a container you want to make sure to leave about an inch so that when you water it um, of course you don't overflow the pot. Now when you have added that water crystals in here, you wanna make sure to water your pot thoroughly once, and then after it sets for just a few minutes, go ahead and water it again. It'll take some time for those crystals to really absorb the full amount that they can um, to capacity. So this is how you use water crystals if you have a pot that you're planting up. Now, if you have a pot that's already existing, how do you get those uh, crystals into the soil once it's already planted. Well, there's a couple of different ways. Um, basically, what you're going to do is punch holes into the soil and you can use either a stick um, or a tool and just kind of go around the perimeter of your plant. Doing this will prevent you from getting into the roots too much. Go down quite a ways with that stick. Um, you might also use a tool or something like that to get in there as well. And then again, using a 10 inch pot, we know that we're gonna need uh, one and a half teaspoons. So we're just gonna kind of put a little bit down each hole. That was one teaspoon. Now we need another half a teaspoon. And just divide that evenly amongst those holes that you've created. It doesn't hurt to use your stick again to kind of make sure that all those crystals did get down into that soil profile. Now once you've got those crystals in there, what you're going to do is then cover them with a little more topsoil. So again, those crystals won't explode up out of your pot and they'll remain down there with the roots.
it's starting to get warmer out and in case you're tired of going out and having to water those pots every day, try adding water retaining crystals into your potting soil to make your container garden a little bit happier. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey sows flowers amongst the veggies. Lynn Brandenberger gives us a primer on deciphering chemical labels. We walk through a field of blue bonnets, and we visit the beauty that persists among the ruins. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Green Lake Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.